Well, last time what I was do? here, it was city? five years ago, I wrote a book called The Winter Soldier. It was part of Stack and Monkey Radio. So I had much more uh, accompaniment. Uh, <laughs> a little livelier than I think I can probably manage on my own. But, um, uh, but nonetheless, but it's, so it's, it's fun. I'll get to read a little bit more. I don't have as much competition, I guess. Um, so um, the book just came out on, on Tuesday. Um, and I think that um, the odds are probably no one's had a chance to read any of it. I'm just going to guess that's the direct case. So we'll talk about, I'll talk about it um, as, if, as if this is new, and I try not to give too much away. Um, but thank you, Richard, for the generous introduction. I also have to say that com coming here also involves a lot of just general hospitality. So I arrived this afternoon at around 2, and I spent the day sort of traveling around getting to see Oxford. Last time, I didn't have the time to do that, so it's been real fun. I so appreciate it. Everyone in the store has just been wonderful. So um, I regret I have to go tomorrow. But maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you a bit about uh, the origin of the book and um, sort of how it started, how it came about, and then read just an early passage um, from, from the book, um, and then I'd be happy to take any questions. The, the core story of the book involves a single house in Western Massachusetts over about 400 years, and the different people who, who live there sort of pass through, people and, and animals and ghosts, and sort of every, every plants and fungi, like the kinds of human and non-human individuals who, who make the place their, their home. And um, in the last couple of days as I've done some readings, one of the really fun parts has been people sharing stories about their houses as well. So um, hopefully when I'm done reading, you know, we, we talk. If you have uh, a story about something unique you found um, in your old house, um, I'd love to hear it. Certainly. One of the best parts of writing is making you appreciate like the long, long story that uh, lays behind the places that we live in and that sort of strangely we tend not to know, even though um, the people who lived in our houses like occupy such an intimate space. It's just been fascinating to me. So, but I'd love, so I'd love to hear if you, if you have those sorts of thoughts. Um, so um, as, I, as I mentioned, Northwoods covers this sort of this 400-year period. The, the story begins with a, a pair of uh, Puritan lovers who abscond from a colony. Um, and what had happened, what I I'd, I'd sort of loved this idea of, um, I'd been in Massachusetts, I was walking around the woods, I was seeing all these old houses, and it was all kind of astonishing for me, especially somebody originally from California, who's always lived in these very new houses, and most of them sort of younger than I am. To see all these places, to see houses that have the date that they were built printed on the wall, and, and so I decided to write something that really sort of set back as about as early as I could in terms of, in terms of European habitation or sort of permanent home um, that that uh, could could persist. And so, and I'd grown up with Scarlet Letter. I kind of wanted to write sort of anti-Scarlet Letter, imagining um, somebody who actually sort of gets away and sort of begins a kind of alternative America. Um, and I started writing the, that that book, and I had a couple of, couple of chapters of the book. Um, and um, what happened then was sort of very strange and different for me. That was summertime when I had started, and so the book begins in summer. And I had a fellowship for that year uh, to go to New England uh, to continue working on the book. And autumn came, and I think if you've ever been to New England in autumn, you know it's this really very dramatic experience. The trees change color, the apples start falling. So of course, I was writing a chapter about autumn, uh, and then I had written about halfway through this chapter, and I thought, well, what is if, in addition to running the book through this longitudinal time across these centuries, what was if I also go throughout the calendar year, and I'll try writing um, my September chapters in the month in September, and when September's over, I'll move on to October. If I'm not done, I'm going to have to go back later to try to finish it up, and when October finishes, I'll move on to November. This is this was very different for me, also because the last book that I wrote took me 14 years, and, and it was total torture, and I thought maybe at least this could help direct me and try to get it done, at least a draft done in a period of time. Um, and the match that I didn't really expect would happen is that it meant that nature totally dictated the, the structure of the book, because if I wanted to know what the landscape around the house looked like, what the woods looked like, Basically, the research consists of going outside with my dog and walking around in the woods, 
and noticing and then going back and putting it into the pages. And when I went back to the book later and was editing with my editor, um, I was double checking by looking at the photographs that I'd taken um, during those months or looking at the way they pull up on your iPhone um, and seeing the colors change through the seasons. Um, so the first chapter is the story of the Spirit and Lovers, that's in the summer. Um, what follows right afterwards is the story of a native raid on a colonial settlement during the French and Indian War um, and the capture of a woman who's uh, brought then uh, into the woods, into the, this little stone house, this stone cabin there. And this is about 50, 60 years after those lovers had settled there. We don't know what happened to them, but we do know that the woman um, remains there. I mean, so she'll be in that house, and she's the one who takes care of this captive um, for this period of time. So that, and that story is told through a, an account that this captive writes in the margins of a Bible uh, that's later found in the house and sort of becomes a sort of um, link to the past that makes its appearance in later chapters of the book. So we learn her story from that, that marginalia. Uh, the next the chapter that follows uh, is the story of an English scout who goes to the house, who's killed, I won't tell you how, um, who's killed, but right before he's killed, he's eating an apple. Um, and so he falls, and as he decays, the um, apple also decays into the earth, and the seed sets down roots and begins to grow, grow up through his root cage and becomes a tree. Um, and 60 years later, is, is a tree in the middle of the forest, and this abandoned, this abandoned forest behind this abandoned, for this abandoned house. So that's, so I'll read um, now in, around this, this story takes place around, around, this chapter takes place around the 1750s. Um, we can imagine the house as a tree that's already grown, the house has been abandoned. The chapter that I'm going to read from is a letter told by an English major, or a letter written by an English major to his daughters. His name is Charles Osgood. He was sort of destined for glory in the English army um, when he's wounded on the battlefield in Canada by a, a bayonet that has been recently used to cut an apple. And upon his sort of miraculous survival, he um, decides that this means he's fated to leave the army and, and uh, create an orchard. And, um, and this is his life's goal. And, um, and he then sets off into the wood to, um, to find a place to do that. His family is quite distressed about this because they had expected that he would follow in the military footsteps of everyone else. And so I thought the section that I would read from you is a section um, in which, a section from his letter, um, in which he describes how the family, upon learning of his intent, um, calls a doctor to try to treat him for this obsession. Uh, and then he goes on and talks a little about the app. So I'll read for about 15 minutes. I will say he's a man with a pungent vocabulary. Um, I see there's at least one individual here um, who's of a younger age. Um, so I can either edit or it's okay. okay. Um, it's not terrible. It's not terrible language, but but it, it would not be uh, it would be deep bad on television. So, uh, but I'll keep I'll, I'll, I'll keep it because um, it's it's who he is, and uh, he appears later in the book too, um, and sort of recognized by the I'd say the pungency of his language. So um, he's, he's, he, the letters written in these like little chapters. Um, what else would you need to know? His sister's name is Constance. He has two daughters. Their twin sisters, they named Alice and Mary. They become the, the central characters of the next chapter, and then very important characters for the rest of the book. But at this point in time, they're just um, they're just five years old. He's a he's a widower, um, and he had a Batman, an assistant named Rumble, who had accompanied him to fight in Canada, and has sort of stuck by his side as his the personal assistant is kind of putting up with him as he runs around in the woods trying to find um, trying to find a place to build his build his orchard. This little mini chapter in his letter this is uh, entitled On My Purported Madness and the Question of What is a Lunatic. Take a man in perfect health and let him assert against the general opinion, and you will find such a man accused of deviancy or error or madness. Such was my fate that my sister and brother, while pretending to listen patiently to my dreams, were in fact conspiring behind my back. At the time, I was wont to wander the city meditating on my future course. It was upon my return from one of these rambles that I found my house mysteriously empty, except for my siblings. My daughters, Constance, can we understand, 
had been taken on an excursion, which was for the better, for I was to be visited by one Dr. Arbuthnot, who had agreed to my examination at half past three. I had no time to object, for the hall clock chimed the half hour and was answered by an arrogant little knock. Now, if only the man had been as wise as he was punctual. Indeed, I knew of his reputation, both that which he flaunted as a great surgeon of the war and that which was whispered among the soldiers as Dr. Rongo Leg. A reasonable man might then and there have refused him, and yet I was aware that it behooved me to pretend to cooperation. Therefore, I girded myself to suffer this idiot and smiled warmly and welcomed him into my sitting room while Constance ordered up some biscuits. The doctor was in a buoyant mood, having just come from a bleeding, in which he had taken off three liters and seen the child return most miraculously to health. It was further proof, he said, that illness persisted because the physician did not confront it aggressively. And because he knew I was a military man, he employed the most martial language. What was needed was to launch full assault upon my fancy, hunt every last vestige of the offending humor as would the most, one would the most heinous traitor, and treat it without, and here he slammed the coffee table, mercy. Of course, I should have walked out right there, but his imperious manner so irritated me that I became set on defying him. Lead me, I told him, rolling up my sleeve. Ah, but bleeding was for general lunacy, he said. <laughs> Whereas mine was most particular, a homomania, so to speak, a madness for fruit alone. <laughs> and he explained that a soldier who has lain out in the field for hours will find his circulation altered by natural miasma. Thus the spleen was tilted off its axis, and via sympathy began to act upon the circulation of the lymph, which acted on the blood, the blood on the phlegm, the phlegm on the bile, the bile on the juice of gastric, and so on, eventually imparting its momentum to the fluids of the cord. From there was but a skip to the brain, lengthening the medulla oblongata, and tugging open the recently discovered lesser operculum, the guardhouse of the cerebrum, to which raced fancies, notions, images, and even, and here he whispered in a low voice, passions or as they say in French, patience. However, this was not the cause of my troubles. No? Dr. Arbuthnot shook his head quite gravely. After all, we all had errant fancies, notions, images, passions. Indeed, last night, while he was, well, it mattered not what he was doing, but he fancied for a moment that his wife was his wife's sister, while well, they looked nothing alike. No, the danger was the premature closing of the operculum and the subsequent trapping of said fancies, notions, images, and passions, which like rabbits, like hamsters, like, God forbid, rabbit and hamster together, entranced by that state of such promiscuity that might attend any shared enclosure within such tight quarters, such as traveling with a lady in a warm, sultry, jostling carriage. Well, we got the idea. It was a matter of augmentation, fecundation, intermingling, producing even more fanciful fancies, notional notions, passionate notions, fanciful passions, etc., etc. the effect being, well, and with a flurry and a flourish, he indicated me. I'm sorry? You, said the doctor, this. I told him that I did not follow. Again, he began to muster his argument, but my brother interrupted. And this uh, dreaded operculum, might it be removed? Remove the lesser operculum? Arbuthnot nearly threw over the table in astonishment. And for a long time, he laughed with heaves that shook his teary jowls. And he had thought he'd heard everything. We waited. Briefly, I hope my siblings had seen that this man was loonier than I. Removed. My God, no, said Arbuthnot, not at last, but opened. The treatment apparently had been worked out long before the discovery of the lesser operculum itself. The key was to coax it open with treats. He was quite fond of bread soaked in raccoon seed that had bound, been bound for three days to the udders of an unwashed ewe. One needed but to inhale the mixture, and the vapors locked up behind the operculum would flee faster than a horde of prisoners through an open prison gate. Fortunately, he had a sample with him. Well, asked my sister. By then I was so relieved that he would neither bleed nor purge me that I happily leaned forward towards the vial that he had withdrawn from his coat. Now inhale, said Arbuthnot, deeply. For a long time, I inhaled. What none knew was that I had recently obtained from my daughters 
a most dreadful cold, which had left my smelling apparatus entire, almost entirely dysfunctional. Around me, I could see the faces of my family grow pale. There was a thump from the parrot cage. Even the doctor's eyes began to strain. <clears throat> and how will we know <clears throat> when the lesser operculum has opened Constance at last? Ah, but here the authorities differed. Laurentius described a puff of smoke and Hundertius the dropping from the nostril of a little grain, while the famed Antheus proclaimed, and to this belief Arbuth not subscribed, that folly had no physical form at all. We will know, said Arbuthnot, when he no longer thinks of fruit. It's not mad to think of fruit, said I. You be quiet, said Constance. Sniff, man, said John. And I sniffed for a long time, until my sister fainted. For a ripe old view it was. Can't you just bleed him? asked my brother. And if you wonder why I have gone on so long about this story, it is that you might see which man among these was the ass, and recall it against any future slander against my sanity. Proclaimed incurable, I was recommended to the madhouse, but my family knew all the dangers of such an incarceration to our name, so I was left to roam. For my war service, I had been given a tract of land by the fox kill, but it took only a single visit to the neighboring farms to realize that it was too flat, too wet for apples. So I left the girls with Constance and set out looking for new land. And because I was already well into my fifth decade of life and did not have much left time left for error, I decided I must seek the tree first and the land would follow. And a natural tree, it must be. Many were the grafted varietals available in the nurseries of Albany, but I wouldn't have them. No pampered English import. No effete continental still reeking of the paws of some French fruitier. Mine would be wild, American. Around it I would build my new life. And so, that very month, as the carts began to make their way to village markets, I set out on horseback with Rumbold at my side. And I came to realize that the country was overflowing with apples. Scraggly crab trees grown up from cores tossed off, tossed off in roadside culverts. Ranks of stately new town pippins. Unnamed heirlooms growing in the solitude in a settler's yard. How profligate America was with her apples. How had I ever not noted? Less than two centuries ago, not a seed had touched the soil. And now they were everywhere, dropped by bare-armed boys with juicy chins. Gentry passing in their carriages. Lovers who in distant fields had hurled the cores and turned to different pastimes. They grew from pig shit, cow shit, dog shit, fish shit, sprung up from raven droppings from the forking branches of chestnuts. My God, until that moment I had never noticed, it was as if one might subtract all matter but the apple tree and still see in what remained the contours of the world. And I tasted all of them. For two weeks I tasted. I made my way through Albany and Ghent, across the hills and valleys between the Hudson and the Connecticut, scouring markets, interrogating puzzled farm girls with my questions about varieties and soil. Twice discovering some resplendent solitary tree of fruit unlike any I'd ever tasted, I approached the nearest hovel and made an offer for the land. Both times they refused me. For why would they trust this stranger with his servant lingering behind him? It was their patch, their tree, the benediction granted for their stewardship, their land. An American tree of American soil. If this was the first innovation that would lead me to glory, my second was to fill my pockets with coins and follow the children. They all had a tree, the children did, a sprawling coppice in the graveyard depths, a silver dryad with her many marbled fingers, a Dell matron with long arms drooping her burden to the earth. They showed me trees with oblong red-black fruit or tight, smooth spheres as white as pearls, fruit with russeting as thick as potato skin around the sweetest crackly flesh. And then far up a valley where a thin string of farms had pierced the howling wilderness, a snub-nosed boy, perhaps sensing easy prey, <coughs> haggled another penny for his services and led me on a long and winding path deep into the woods. 
Ah, how I recall it was day, as if it were yesterday. The thickets were so dense I had to leave my horse's rumble. The mist was drinking thick. The path was stony, serpentine, vanishing into a meadow like an illusion, before emerging, just as illusory, in the wet cowlick of a wind-blown field. Leaving the meadow, we entered the final grove of oak and chestnut. The land rose slowly, then steeply, and at the point of this inflection, I could see a little cabin, and I readied for another settler to tell me off his land. Or worse, I thought, registering the gathering evening, the silence into which the whistling boy had fallen. Perhaps my guide had sent him more than a penny to be found on this stranger, and had led me to a brigand den. And it would end here, in the dark woods, my pockets empty, a thief's stiletto in my heart. But still I followed. Drizzle became rain. I could barely see the bounding boy. At times I had but the dark parting through the ferns to guide me. I reached the cabin, most strange, this home of log and stone, with wooden beams that once had held a roof, now fallen. More ferns grew from the walls, vines curled around the broken wood, and asters bloomed amidst the rubble. But I didn't have time to expect it further, for the boy was whistling again, and I followed him past the cabin to the tree. The ground beneath was two apples deep, and they fizzed and popped as I approached. Animals had picked clean the lowest branches. The wind was blowing through the surrounding birches. The boughs swayed. Nearby, a single rain-white apple beckoned. I reached. It slipped beyond my fingers. Another wind. Again, the apple rose, up, up, higher, and at the height of its curve, it seemed to pause as if considering the worthiness of its petitioner and then swung down into my hand. Thin veins of crimson ran through its spring green flank. Faint streaks of russeting, a blush that seemed to change in color as I raised it in the failing light. When I bit into it, I had the sense of tasting not only with my tongue, but deep within my palate, a scent more than a flavor, as light as lemon blossoms, before a second wave came spreading through like syrup. What in heaven was this, I wondered. An apple, of course, an apple in all ways, and yet I had never eaten an apple like this. No one had ever eaten an apple like this. Erotum. The boy had tasted. The little sandaled creature now eyeing me from where he crouched upon a field stone. I wanted to weep. I felt the forest watching as I reached up to take another apple. Then I paused. The house was empty, the ground thick with rotting windfall and still I felt as if I were trespassing on, no, on another's bounty. So I took just four more, for Constance, for Alice, for Mary, and one for Rimble, who must be cold and worried back on the road. Then one more for myself. It was pitch black when I reached the place where we'd started. Rain streamed over my servant's hat. Grinning stupidly, I held up the fruit and said, simply, I found it. Then I rummaged in my pocket for another penny, but the boy was gone. I'll stop there. And so, so this is the tree then. So he'll go on to take cuttings of the tree and build a portrait of a hundred trees that his daughter spent help him name the Osgood Wonder. And the Osgood Wonder becomes a sort of locally famous um, tree in this this corner of New England. Um, then when he dies, the farm's taken over by Alice and Mary, um, who go through life without marrying, although it becomes sort of tense when one of them begins to fall in love. But they'll raise then the wonder and sort of spread its name. Um, the chapter after that is um, a chapter about the panther that's on the cover of the book that comes to the house um, for the sheep that are no longer tended after the sisters are gone, and then the chapter about that after that, the weeds that come in, and, and so forth. And, um, so, so, but anyway, um, that's the beginning of the book, uh, since you haven't read it. Um, anyway, I, I guess, so now, happy to answer any questions, um, and also very happy to have, not even just an old house, but a house that's sort of a mystery about it. Um, love to hear about that, too. That's, that's fun for me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so did you write a lot of this during the pandemic?
So the question is, did I, did I write this during the pandemic? Yeah. Um, I really had a hard time writing during the pandemic. I began to think about it during the pandemic, um, but I, I mean, I spent most of the pandemic you know, doing some Zoom teaching, supervising my children on Zoom school, probably what spent most of the pandemic doing. Um, but I did spend a lot of time walking around the woods. Um, but 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 it, so it was only afterwards um, when I, I had a year long fellowship. Um, and I was able to take off time from work, and so it was most of the time. But yeah, being cooped up and thinking about the, so there was sort of, I think, a long fuse lit by um, the claustrophobia of the pandemic. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, what was the idea behind the cover of the book? Behind the cover of the book? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I personally love the cover of the book. It is it's my favorite cover that I've ever had of a book. Um, and the publisher, those of you who work in publishing know this, um, tries out a lot of different covers. And so, um, but once this showed up, I, I really sort of fell in love with this cat. So, so this is, in New England, the, the term for a panther is a cat announce. It's wonderful sort of American regionalism. Um, I don't know, does that make any sense? In Mississippi, cat mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so, um, they, in, well, there are no native population of catamount um, or, or panthers in the Northeast anymore, though every once in a while one will wander in um, and sort of show up at a reservoir roadside. Um, happened just a couple documented times. So in the book, the, this panther is a recurring character. Um, and I would say, arguably, one particular panther returns several times over the course of there's a supernatural element of the book over the course of, say, 300 years. Um, and so this, I think, I'm very happy to imagine that this is what she looks like. She's kind of this recurring motif in the book. Um, vengeful, protecting, she kind of looks out to the guard, looks at kind of a garden nest of the house and the people who live there, if they're good to the house and land around. Yeah. So Daniel, I'm a native of Mississippi and he's gotten to know uh, Massachusetts stone walls and thinking about the lives that were there and mm. the hands that created those walls mm. and the, the generations over time. Uh, just your story of, of the house and the generations that interact with the house. Could you talk a little bit more about the impact of that place and, mm. and those remnants of the past and lives and, and how that developed as the idea for the book? Yeah, absolutely. So the question is about, um, you know, particularly in New England, though, of course, it's the same here, it's the same in a lot of places. It's the, the past is particularly present, or at least the last 300 years of the European settlement past is particularly, um, I think, easy, easy to see in New England. Some people have said it's, um, there's this wonderful architectural historian who writes a book in which he, he attributes this to the Flinty New England character, um, which wouldn't wreck a house, but would rather repair it or reuse it, um, wouldn't knock down a barn. Um, but would rather drag the barn um, across the yard and attach it to another building and turn it into like a new inn. So I think maybe that's the same in Beverly Hills. They get people just, and so it's wonderful. So you can study these old houses. And I think that was one of the things that got me really excited about it initially, suddenly to realize that I was looking at a building, but it wasn't, there was the core salt box house in the village built in the 17th century, but then this little L was built on the side, maybe a hundred years after that, and then a larger wing in federal style after that. And so like, the history is literally there in the architecture. Um, and it's just had this, it just suggested this wonderful corollary for a book, as you can see of each chapter in the history of the house. So, um, so you get a sense of that sort of, that sort of presence. Um, but, but even beyond that, the walls are just so extraordinary. Um, I think that anyone who's been to New England and walked around in New England, um, you know, sees you come across these walls everywhere, and um, just th there are books and books about the wall. Like there are people who like obsess about the walls. But some of the wonderful things that I love about the walls, I think, you know, maybe, um, I can go off on the walls a bit. So I don't want to divert too much from your your question, but I think it still an answers it. So um, the free stuff thaw cycle, the earth will push a stone up um, during the winter, and then it will eventually emerge from the soil. So the earth is like constantly offering up 
stones. And the farmer who's trying to create a field for agriculture um, or for pasturage has to deal with these stones. Um, and you look at the stones, and it, I've tried to move some of these stones. These are heavy, heavy stones. And if you think of people carrying these stones onto ox carts and moving them about, the amount of human labor is just totally extraordinary. Like literally, when people sweat, you know, and blood, given how hard it is to hold hold the stone. Um, so that I think that for me was the, the most outstanding um, image of suggesting the presence of someone who was there before, in part really because it is such incredible labor um, at a time when machines weren't weren't around. One of the best things I reading, first thing I did was in Boston. This guy asked, where do you see these road, uh, these walls? I didn't know that there are walls around here. <laughs> and it was like everyone else in the store like turned to look at him. Like, where have you been? Uh, and then people started shouting out their favorite place to see walls in the Boston area. So, uh, so I read that uh, the settlers thought that the devil was pushing the stones up. Oh, to wow. The uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. I didn't know that story. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I'll just repeat that um, in case folks didn't hear it. Um, that the devil, that there's a mythology that that, uh, that the devil was pushing the stones up out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some old pictures um, of the field. It's really amazing. Massachusetts is much more forested now than it was 200 years ago. And in fact, it was on a trajectory. It was reforesting, which is sort of astonishing in America, up until very recently when it just started. The trend started in the opposite direction again. You look at old pictures and they're just these bare fields filled with stones. It's like completely unrecognizable for what it looks like today. Stones everywhere. Yeah. Thanks. Yes? You have a scientific background, most of them. And um, I was wondering, when you're writing about nature, is it possible to write about nature without writing about the supernatural? Mm. That's a great question. Um, so is it possible to write about nature without writing about the supernatural? I don't think, um, I, I mean, I, they began very much the fear connected to me, but I'm not so sure I would have thought about that that way beforehand. Um, that, so I just had to write, like, as part of um, publication, um, you know, sometimes in the 19th that they asked us to, like, recommend certain books. I was just asked to recommend a ghost story, and the, the book that I chose is a ghost story is a book called um, Reading the Forested Landscape by a man named Tom Lessels. It's a very New England regional book, but essentially um, what it is is a guide to how to walk into a forest and look at the forest and how to take clues from the forest of the present uh, and use that to interpret what was there in the past. And so if, there's, if, there, if the mound's on the ground lay in a particular direction, it might suggest that there was a storm and you can date the storm based on the size of the trees and the origin based on the trees. And he's a genius in the way he describes it. But that always felt to me like a ghost story because it's not just the particular set of species that are there at that moment, um, but also there's this, they're there because of the things that were there before it. Um, we certainly, like when I'm there, like there are moments where you feel a kind of, I feel a kind of grandeur and a kind of connectedness. Um, I don't know if I call it supernatural or spiritual. Um, but I love the idea that uh, the ghosts don't necessarily need to be human. Um, and or a, or a, a panther. And, you know, like for, if we have a ghost world supernatural, it would be ghost of plants, ghost of fungus. I don't know. Just some thoughts about it. What do you think? Do you think that... Uh, <laughs> for asking the question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I kind of agree that the elemental aspect of nature is always there and they just and the history of any place is still there. It's always felt to me. So. Yeah, I always find it amazing that, like, even listening to scientists describe the woods, there's always a scientific description, and then maybe not everybody, but it's almost like after you've described um, all the ecology that, that you've learned from your practice, it all seems they all seem to be some sort of emergent spiritual problem that occurs in addition to the. Ecology, like it's, it's, I don't know. I feel it hard to find, um, like friends who are botanists. Like it always seems to be a sort of element of mysticism at the end of the day in their in their practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a bedrock of magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, anyone want to?
want to share anything about their house. I don't know how we are on town, but I'm happy about such a sign. Does anyone live in an old house? Yes. Well, this is um, my grandpa built a house in Mexico, and right now my mom ended up having it out of nine siblings, and now she needs to sell the house. Um, and it's been trying to sell and sell, and this house doesn't want to sell. Like, for mm. one reason or another, like, it does not sell. Mm. And so we think it's the spirits of my grandparents not wanting to sell the house. <laughs> house. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I read the question that says, how do we live on even after we're gone? You know, I think we, I've been at least thinking a lot about that with this house and mm. my family. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I, like, I mean, I think we've all been through this, like if we have uh, go through relatives' belongings, um, all these things that have incredible meaning, um, that when the person's gone, like all that meaning just, a little remains, but virtually all of it is, is gone. It's all so astonishing. There are lots of tag sales in New England. Um, and one goes and you know, for a couple dollars, you see these doilies, these sweaters, and these pieces of artwork. Um, and I mean, I remember at one point going with a, f a friend and um, she wanted a woman who was selling things because she had to move. And she was so, so sad. And I think not only it was just the move, but it was also everything that had that meaning was now being stripped of that meaning as it was passed on to someone else. It's, it's really astonishing how that occurred. Thanks. After yeah. spending a year there, did you, were you tempted to move or not? Well, so I actually lived there part time now. Oh, okay. So yeah, I totally, I fell in love with, I, I, I fell in love with the place. And, Woods. So, yeah. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> yeah. Can I see another hand? Yes. Um, it's not my house that I live in, but it's a paternal grandparent's house. And uh, it's one of those big old houses you got to go into the mountains to get to. Mm. And um, the master bedroom, the bedroom they sleep in, there's no door to it. Just kind of like open on the second floor. Mm. That's one of those things where it's like old houses just feel like they have a different character, mm. even down to like how they're built. Mm -hmm. Sure. And you wonder about the decisions that goes behind yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming. Appreciate it.